So firstly, who am I and, and why you should listen to me? Um, I'm Chris Phillips. I've been IBM my whole career for 14 years. Uh, I've done 12 years in integration. I've authored many papers on our IBM API Connect uh, and Cloud Pack for integration to a degree. Uh, I'm considered by many as an API guru. Um, this is another title I, I particularly enjoy, but the sales team in, in, insists on using it. Uh, and my role essentially is I go around the world, originally face to face, but now, obviously, because of COVID remotely, talking to clients to understand the challenges they are having. And now some of these challenges are technical with software. Quite often, I'll probably say 40% of them, it is around how to actually use the software and apply the software to their organization because there's no two organizations that are the same. And so what I'll be covering here is sort of thoughts and sort of almost philosophical statements on what people are doing today and, and the problems you should try and avoid. There is not a magical one size fits all for governance. Governance is a very subjective topic. But the, the thing here is if you get it wrong, it's really hard to retrofit it later. Um, I have a blog. Uh, here's a few articles on my blog. Um, you can tell I've not traveled much in the last 18 months. There's a lot less articles than before, but because um, I used to write them on, on the airplanes. Um, but <clears throat> I have thoughts and ramblings on here and all sorts of stuff. LinkedIn, I use heavily. I don't really use Twitter. Uh, I'm there because occasionally my brother sends me a funny picture. I see it six months later. Um, so before we start, I, I'm going to set the scene here. And so this session is divided into five parts of meat, a summary, and these initial questions. Uh, and what I want to do here is go through what I think we need to talk about today. Uh, the first question is, what is governance? And governance has a thousand definitions out there. You can look through many different ones. And the, the way I normally describe it and what I like to talk about when I get asked to talk about governance is more around the lines of such as ownership. Who is responsible for supporting and enhancing APIs and infrastructure? Who is essentially who, who, whose head's on the block when it goes wrong? Who gets promoted when it goes right? Who do you chase down when there's a problem? And then certifications, the second point is, what are the rules and, and, and hoops that you need to jump through in order to uh, get things published and get things going in the right sort of consistency and the right approach? And then finally, standards. How do you ensure this consistency is used ab above it? It's no good having, well, one, I, I go through many anecdotes, but one of the anecdotes is last time I presented uh, on this topic, I think it was a year, six months ago, maybe a year ago, one person came to me afterwards and say, the problem we have is we have six and a half thousand APIs in our state built by 65 different teams with different motivations, different design principles. How do we try and make these all into a single joined up platform? And this is why the standards need to be in place early. It's really hard to go and change that many APIs to make them look and feel like a one cohesive unit. Um, but if you don't do that, then you look very bitty and, and unthought out and, and it doesn't feel like a, 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 a well thought out platform. So why do we care? Um, I always get asked, why do we care? Well, if you don't do governance, you don't understand your larger estate. Lots of organizations are great at looking at the single individual APIs of this API needs to do job X and it's got to adhere to that and it's got to. But when you're looking at running a larger state, and by large here, I mean more than three. As soon as you get to them like six APIs, then you have to start making sure these processes are in place. But you need to understand what you're managing. How many APIs are you managing? What do they do? Who's responsible for them? You may not be responsible for them. You may just be the one in charge of the overall platform. Understanding the separation of responsibility. You as the platform owner, are you responsible for fixing bugs in the APIs in the, in the platform? What happens if there's an unclear bug? What happens if there's an argument between the platform and the API provider? How do you split that res responsibility? But also API consistency and reuse. As I said before, you need to make sure you have one single cohesive pattern going through. And why, why am I building an API platform? Or why am I running an API platform? I should change the slide to now. Um, and there's three reasons why people run API platforms. And, and everyone generally fits into two of these. 
I've yet to see anyone fit into all three. You're building APIs to provide and track function to expose it to a wider audience. The second one is you're trying to simplify the consumption of APIs to remove the amount of support required for new users. So you're trying to simplify the onboarding so people can start using your stuff without distracting your developers who are building APIs. And the third most common reason, quite frankly, someone at a senior level said, we need an API strategy because all our competitors do and the analysts say we do and we're being told off for not having one. This is honestly the most common reason I see. And I would go as far as saying every customer I've been to meets two of these. Most of them, it's the bottom one and the top one. Occasionally, it's the middle one and the bottom one. Once or twice, it's been the top two. But you need, but you always need to come back and understand why are you doing this when it comes to governance? What, what are we governing the right things? We're not governing for the sake of ticking boxes. We're governing in order to achieve and provide the best platform available to both the providers and the consumers. So let's jump onto the first piece of me. API design and certification. And this is where I quite get often beaten up by my colleagues and my mentors say, well, why has API design got anything to do with governance? Um, it's also a certification and checking you're going through the right boxes and you tip the right, you've tipped the right hoops and all that stuff. The whole point of all of this is to ensure the design is good and useful. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to say, this is the steps you do it. What I'm going to say here is these are the rules you need to consider and take a much more philosophical approach. There are, There is no one way of solving this. Every client has different motivations and every customer has different ways of using it. Every um, API provider has a different way of using this. So the first rule, as you probably gathered, is consistency is key. You need to have APIs that follow a, ideally a single approach or at least a one of two approaches. It does, I don't really care what the approach is, as long as it makes sense to you, the people providing it. But if you start having sort of six or seven APIs that have different data models, different ways to paths, and you're making your consumers relearn your API. Each, for each API, they have to relearn a new data model, and there's no consistency between them. You're making it harder for them to con conceive and make use of it. In my opinion, the consumer is 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 the, is the target audience here, not the ability to say you're providing APIs, but it's consumer is using and calling APIs. So, the way I'd go into describe this is the data model schema. This has to be consistent across operations and paths approach. Have the same path structure. Have the same approach. Have, use verbs consistently. When do you use put? When do you use patch? All that good stuff. Grouping, when you are in API, IBM API Connect, which is the product I'm an SME in, is you, we publish APIs as a group in what we call a product. Now, I know other, I don't really care much about our competitors. I, I, so I know some of our competitors do something similar. But why do you put APIs in that group? What, what is the logical reason? I always push to have it as a single group to be a use case, to understand what... So to provide a way for the consumers to have one product assigned to to complete a set of tasks or a, a group of use cases. We are beyond the days now where you'll need a single API to complete a use, use case or set of use cases. It's now multiple APIs that are going to be needed. And that's why I position using the grouping it as a per, per use case. But the key thing here is having that grouping consistent. It's no good having some of it by... <clears throat> Uh, use case and some of it by ownership and some of it by what day of the week it was published on or whatever you choose. Naming conventions. So ensuring that names, versions, path names, data model names are all consistent approach. approach, approach so when you look at a name you can of two APIs, you can see the connections and the similarities of moving it on between them. The second rule is thinking about consumption. And your motivation may be to just get stuff out there for people to use it. Um, but I, I don't know. I've only met one client who was judged at the end of his yearly review on how many APIs exposed. Everyone else is generally judged and graded on how many APIs or how many APIs are being used. And consumption for, was one of the whole points of the API ecosystem boom a few years ago. And it's kind of 
twisted and changed to where we are today. But the consumption is such a critical point. And the goal should be to allow 90% of consumers to start using an API without any direct connection to the team building the API. I actually would say it's 100%, but we all know 100% is pretty hard to get to. Um, but there should be no reason that someone can't go and look at your API and your developer portal or your shop window and possibly self-service on board, possibly with approvals to get up and going. Because if you don't do this, your developers who are looking at building the APIs and enhancing the APIs, they are wasting t their time supporting people on boarding. Now, as much as I say the platform responsibility is, is about API consumption, an individual developer's responsibility is exposing function. And so they much rather continue coding, working on the next big thing, not assisting the current people using the current one or even necessarily a previous generation. So these are the recommendations we always put in place here is, is the API documented? Is the documentation uh, available inside the API spec? Are all aspects of it documented? And the specification, at least the OAI 2 and 3, are so detailed and so good that they actually have spaces for this documentation that things like our developer portal, and I'm sure others, will render this directly in a view for anyone to come and see. Is the documentation in the correct language? Now, I don't mean programming language here. I mean, if your target audience is South American Spanish developers, maybe they don't want it in English. Maybe they want it in Spanish. If your target audience is global, then pick English. I'm, I'm lazy. I don't speak any other languages. I apologize. But the point is, look at who will be consuming this and make sure it's accessible. Is the documentation correct? How frequently do we make changes but not update documentation in the specification? I would probably say very, very often from my experiences. And where is it available? How do people find it? Do they go to a central developer portal to find this information? Or do they have to go and Google it? Or do they need to phone up Bob in accounting to ask him who, uh, who who's responsible for this? How do they access this information? If you can't access the documentation for consuming an API, no matter how simple the API is, it's going to be painful for getting people on board. And are there examples? And finally, is there a way for a consumer to see how the API works in your platform? The key thing here is an API that is in uh, the, the developer portal inside our product, it provides you a functionality to be able to go and test these APIs out. Now, everyone could say, well, I could go and use Postman and all that stuff. But the beauty of having it in the developer portal, firstly, is you don't need to configure your Postman up and running. And secondly, it, it means there's no chance that you've got any global configuration settings that are in, interfering it. And so many clients I have been to, like the way that IBM API Connect has this facility to try your APIs. And you can quickly see, is this an issue that can be solved by the, the API providers that so they've got a bug in it? Or is it an issue that is in your application? And it lets you draw this line very quickly on where responsibility lies, which again, improves communication and reduces the time to moving forward. So certifications. I'm not gonna say here, sit here and say, these are the certifications you must do. The, what I mean by certifications are checks and balances. How do you know when your API is certified by your internal standards to go live? Um, I'm not going to sit here and say these are the certifications you must adhere to. I will sit here and say these are the things you need to consider. And which is, firstly, as much of the certification process has to be automated. One of the reasons SOA governance was so painful is we always had design review boards that would review everything going through. And this massively, massively impacted the velocity of producing new APIs and new solutions. What we need instead is have this as automated as much as possible. And using linting tools, which I'll cover shortly, and other things, you should be able to get this process up and running as swiftly as you can, swiftly. And you should have everything clearly documented. These rules should be in a single place that everyone can access. And it shouldn't be 400 pages. I, I kid you not, one customer I was at, I think, gave me an 80-page certification guidelines of what their APIs must be, maybe services back then. Uh, that everyone had to adhere to. No one's going to read 10 pages properly. 
you can probably get away with 10 pages of maximum, but you need a s simplified document where we justify it. The rules must be policeable. There's no, not enforceable, policeable. They must, they, if they are not, the rule will not be followed. The rules must be simple, clear, with a justification in place. So that when someone says, I don't want to do that, I don't understand it, or I don't want to do that because I'm a special case, they understand the risk they are taking by going around it. And you need to have a manual exception process. And no single set of certification is ever going to be perfect. But if an exception is used, say, 25% of the time, and I'm making up that figure, you may want to make it lower. I wouldn't make it higher. You need to go back and look at the original rules of why are people going around or why are people applying um, for an exception to the process? What has caused this and what is the consequence of this? And maybe you need to go and change, review and change the original rules. There's no harm in changing and keeping rules up to date. There is a harm in blindly having rules that no one remembers why they are there. So uh, the only two sample certification steps in, and I expect everyone to have these two. Uh, is manually checking for duplication of function. Do you have two APIs that do the same job in a slightly different way? So it might be different payloads. That should be discouraged, if not banned. And the only way you can really do that is manually every now and then is to do a review of what's coming through. And the other one is, does the API meet the specification? As in, does it meet the OAI2 or OAI3 or RAM or whatever specification you want to follow? Does it actually meet that spec? So that is sort of the first step of going through API designer certification. I'm now going to move on to API lifecycle and versioning. So first, a question for the audience here. And if you can put an answer in the chat, I'd appreciate it. If you can't, no worries. How many versions of an API should be available to a new consumer at the same time? How many versions of an API should be available to new consumers at the same time? So let me start with the most common run answer, as many as are needed. But my answer, and it's a subjective question to a degree, is two-ish. And we will come on to why it's two over the next few slides. But one client I visited had 75 versions of the same API and was not aware of who was using which one, and so was not able to take them out or retire them. This caused them painful headaches because they were now supporting more systems, more, more overhead because more APIs that were running. And also, uh, when they had a zero day uh, issue where they had to make a change, they had to make a change to 75 APIs instead of just two or three. In my strategy, you have to make a change to at least two, probably a couple more, but it shouldn't be 75. So let's start about versioning. Now, out on the internet today, you can find a thousand good strategies for how to version your APIs. And I'm not going to just sit here and repeat it. And up here on the right, thanks to my daughters, I have a couple of uh, samples. You could have things labeled one, you could have one dot strategy, a two dot strategy, a three dot strategy, a two dot with a date strategy. Uh, three random words, and the other one is just a random word. So if you ask your daughter to chat three random words, I've got unicorn banana cheese back. I think that's why it was selected. So I'm not going to say here, use this strategy every time, because there's many factors that need to be considered. And everyone watching this or listening to this is, is a clever person who's, who's been through this before. Um, so what I said, I'm going to say, these are the things you need to consider uh, when you're putting together your version and standard. And you must have a single version and standard for your platform. Ideally, company, but let's live in the real world. Most people have multiple version and standards in their company. Um, each part of a version must have a clear, justified purpose. So if you take a look on the top right, you will see that we have the, let's say the third line, the 2.1.4. In there, we're saying each number there must map onto something that makes sense and must uh, and must be justified. So two could be a major version number. So that means there is a significant change to the interface that is not backwards compatible. 
The one could be there is a change to the interface, but it's not backwards compatible. And the four could be there's a, no change to the interface, but there is a change to something else. So we fix the documentation. We've uh, added an or we've added an optional attribute or something like that. Might well, be a one if it's not an attribute. There must be no circumstances where two APIs have the same version but are different in any way. And included in this is the documentation and naming. There should be no way uh, that you are publishing an API that already exists with that version number, but there's a change. It sounds obvious, but the number of people who go, oh, we've just changed the typo on paragraph 16 uh, of this documentation description of the API will just overwrite what's already there. The problem with that is a slippery slope, is as soon as you start doing it for that reason, you will then start allowing other changes in other areas. But also from the consumer's perspective, if they catch you changing an API specification without changing the version numbers, they often will be terrified because they can no longer trust that you aren't going to make any other changes. Even if the change you have made is so minor, they will still be ha have a reason for concern that, they, that something else will change in the future. So I always encourage to get these things fixed before it goes live. And, and, and when it does go live without a fixing, as does happen, you accept that this is going to be a version change. Version numbers must not change during the life cycle. So as you go from dev to test to prod to retirement, you can't change the version number. If there needs a version change, for whatever reason, it goes back to the start. And it should, should be possible to describe the standard in less than half a page. So whichever one of these options you choose, less than half a page of documentation should allow it to be understandable. I've been given 72 page version and standards before. I deal with a lot of paperwork in my job, just to be clear. <laughs> and speed reading is a useful skill. So, and everything must follow the standard. There should be no exception apart from where there's an exception. So with the same principle that we had in the previous section, there's always going to need to be the occasional exception. For example, you are publishing a public standard where that public standard must dictate that version in it. Uh, I think some of the PSD2 dictated that it must have the correct version number in. That is a valid exception. But if the exception becomes the norm, the standard needs to be looked at and cons considered changing. So moving on to API version lifecycle. Now, I'm going to tie all this bit together in a second. But an API version here is so you have version one of an API. You're now working on version two. Um, there's a standard approach. We see the design first approach or code first approach for building your APIs. I'm not going to go through this in detail. There are two valid approaches. I prefer the first one because I'm a governance guy. Uh, people who are more developers than me prefer the second one because they write, like writing code first. Both have pros and cons. I, I'm not going to go through which is right or wrong here because we've only got 25 minutes left. Once it's designed and built, it is then put into a testing phase. Again, we can sit here and talk for several hours on how you build and test APIs all you like. I, I don't see that as a... Uh, I could use the time here because there are many approved approaches for this. But the area here that I think is most important is what happens once you go into production. So each of these light white boxes represent the API version state. So the API could be live. It could be, and when it's live, this is the version that should be used for all new consumers. So if you are a new consumer of an API, you should use the live one in the live state. Superseded, this version can still be used for new consumers, but it's not recommended. Essentially, this is when it goes to superseded, it means there's it has been replaced by something else. And it is still there because if you are working on a project to consume an API and the project's taken, let's say, six months to go through, and they've gone from they put a new version of the API out, but you are so close to the delivery, you still want to use the existing one, uh, the, the previous one, then that's why superseded does allow people to go and use it. And then we have the deprecated state, which the next one on is existing users must be off this version within a set time period. So, for example, in the developer portal, you will not see the deprecated. You'll only see live and superseded. And anyone who is using a deprecated API is expected to be off it within a set time period. And that is set at the platform level, in my opinion. It is not set at the individual API level. 
And then finally, once it goes after that clock has finished ticking, it goes retired and it's removed from the runtime and developer portal. So it's no longer cool. So while it's in the yellow box, all these APIs can be invoked. It is only in the developer portal for live and superseded. So new people will only see those and start using those. So how do we tie this together when we're talking across multiple API versions? So to quickly throw it through, we have version one, it's live. Version two comes along. Version one goes to superseded, version two goes to live. Version three comes along. Version one goes to deprecated, version two goes to superseded, version three goes to live, and version four is it goes into test. So now we're so and the sh the principle, the guiding principle here is there should never be more than one API version in live and superseded at the same time. So in order to get four across, we must then deprecate version two, supersede version three, and move version four into live. So this means anyone coming on board to start using your API will see version four and version three. And happy days, they can go and use version four or version three if they must. Deprecated wise, we have version two and version one available. But as soon as these ones enter the deprecated state, a clock will start ticking. Now, this could be months, it could be days, it could be ideally not years. But once that timer runs out, it moves from deprecated to retired. The reason for this is if we start enforcing only one version in the deprecated state, which is something I actually like, but that reduces the velocity of your API design and rollout and means that you are having a having more trouble <clears throat> trying to keep up um, because you can only publish APIs as this deprecated clock runs out. Because with, by detaching that, we, we add that flexibility in place. So I've seen no questions so far, uh, nothing from uh, Catherine, or Ka Kathy. Uh, so Kathy, sorry, <laughs> I will keep going. So we've got 20 minutes left. So unit testing of APIs and schemas. And again, people go, unit testing, that's development, that's not governance. And I went, do you unit test your code? And the answer is, well, yes, we should be. <laughs> but everyone's here, your channel, thanks. Um, do you unit test? The answer is yes, we unit test our code. Of course we unit test our code. Who doesn't unit test their code? And the answer is, so guy doesn't hand, come on and puts his hand up and gets shot. Um, but you also need to look at unit testing to validate your schemas as well. Um, and so the common questions I have, which is how do you ensure that your APIs follow any standards? How do we ensure specifications are valid? How do we ensure examples are configured? How do I ensure descriptions are configured? And I would say you use a linting tool. Now, as an IBM, of course, I will recommend our linting tool. It's open source under Apache license, I believe. Uh, it's Open API Validator, and this provides you all the need for your linting and uh, approval, including custom rules as well as from a specification rule. And it'll take a config and then apply it, and then it will give you warning. So let's walk through what well, the key features are Open API 2 and 3 spec. You now have custom rules, different levels of warnings. And now let's go through. So you have your API. You've, your development team have worked tirelessly on this API for the past several days, days, weeks, months, years. And you have got a pipeline of 100 APIs coming through every month that you need to go and check they meet the standards to apply good governance. And you don't want a governance review board to have to go through each one line by line. You want to automate it. So this is where the Open API Validator comes in. The Open API Validator will take a, a config, probably that's in the Git repository, and then as a pipeline, which we'll go through in a minute, or even just manually, it will run through the API and highlight our example set, our description set, our custom rules implemented, our naming conventions set, all this good stuff. And then it will report back warnings and errors to the user. So that could be a error, no examples are set, fail it. It could be warning, um, this description is only three lines long. I may be bit more advanced than what they can do today there, but we can have this concept of going through to understand, are we meeting our corporate needs here without having to do an individual review? Um, and say all this lint is a JSON config that can be updated and modified in Git, and then it's just, just checked out 
when it's run. So how does this fit into the build pipeline? So this is how I have seen it implemented a couple of times, twice. Um, you may have, you, there are a thousand ways of doing this, but this is the one that seems to fit in currently, is use your build. So in my opinion, environmental variables should be put into an API specification on deploy time. Um, I don't like using aspects of products to do it because I feel that's more risk but we can argue that each time. That's in the conversation for another day. So once once we take out the YAML file, we check it, and then we run the linting over. So we do we take the API that's come out of the build, we will put it into the open API validator tool, as we just described, and then it will syntactically validate, is this really an OAI 2 or 3 spec? Are we following these custom rules? Are examples set? Are descriptions set? Are we using breaking any other corporate policies, such as putting uh, verbs into the path name? uh then we deploy it and then we go through your traditional j unit testing so it just goes through as another step as part of your pipeline and it may well be the case that when the linting fails here it reports back an error and it, the, and that will then fail it may just be it reports back a warning and then continue and i've seen warning implemented i haven't seen the fail and error yet but people were looking at and looking at putting that in last time i spoke to them but here we are catching and treating the specification with the same uh, respect as we do the individual code. We are validating that the spec is meeting what's going through without a human review board. The only thing the humans need to do here is produce that configuration to meet the need. So we're gonna jump onto environment segregation. I'm hoping to have 10 minutes left for questions at the end. So the environment dilemma, as I call this, and I have seen this to the point where I think I accidentally created a fist fight at one client. And I'm still, we had a lot of beer that day afterwards. The development team want their own environment so they do not interfere with other development teams. So essentially the development team wants their own domain where they can do whatever the hell they want and they will spit out of their machine an API. And they want to, to have as few rules that they don't control. On the other hand, APIs from multiple teams will be exposed in the same location. So we need to ensure that when you have two APIs together, they don't contaminate each other. A common example, or the most common example of contamination is APIs having the same path, base path. Uh, because um, let's say you have a path called um, order, that's both from the order management system as well as the account system. Both have a concept of order, so you use that as their base path. And I have seen this break at three or four different clients over the last few years of where they sit there going, why is my API not working? And it simply is the URL is the same for both of them. And there may be occasions where there's good reason to have it the same. And this is the dilemma is you can't meet both of these needs simply unless you start working where the middle ground is. And this is where I would position the middle ground, or this is how I would do the middle ground, is I would give each development team its own environment. As far as I'm concerned, they are responsible for onboarding strategy for using that environment. They can do whatever the hell they want. And, and this may just be a logical separation. So in the IBM API Connect, this would be a provider organization. Um, but it's it's it separates out. So they, are, they own it, they manage it, they onboard people. And then these will all then move on next into a shared test environment. Now I put UAT here. It could be system test, it could be UAT, whatever fancy test name you want to have. They all have good purposes. but And that's where this contamination testing will be done as part of it. Then you move on to production, which is obviously shared, and you may go through other test environments, such as performance along the way. You may not, depending on what the need is. And the key thing here is the development team owns all the white boxes. So development teams own their own white box. But the blue ones are shared. Now, the developer team may still be doing the testing in each of these environments. But in order to use these environments, they must follow the procedures of these shared environments. And these shared environments must all or should as closely as possible mirror production. So you would not expect a different strategy in place for production for how that environment is subdivided or how many developer portals you have or how many gateways you have. They should be as close as possible for UAT and performance so that you are testing the, the realistic deployment topology all the way through. 
And finally, the shortest and arguably the most important section here for the most often times I've seen things go wrong for our clients or our, our API providers that we work with is ownership. Every API needs to have an owner and a team that is providing support for that API. The challenge we have here is so frequently with project-based deliveries, which is starting to go out of fashion, which is good, is as soon as the project completes, the delivery team is disbanded. So if the delivery team is disbanded, who then provides support for the API? Who then understands the API? Who is the contact for who, what's going on? And this is needed by so the, the API platform team as much as anyone else. So that if they get paged out in the middle of the night or they get contacted or there's an outage, they know who they need to talk to. And I've seen many places have this problem because the project team has disappeared. They've naturally assumed the API platform team will take over this role of supporting these APIs itself, but they have no idea of what the API is. So they need to be, and they may sometimes not even told they are now responsible for this task. It is just an assumption that it's not clear. So this is very important as contractual information almost. Understand who the contact points are and make sure they are aware of this. The other one, is the ownership from the consumer perspective. Uh, they should have moved. Uh, Mike's just saying the slides have not moved in a while. Catherine, can you confirm if they've moved or not for you? It should say ownership consumer. Sorry, is that yes, they have moved or no, they haven't moved. I think it's just you, Mike, unless someone else would like to jump in for a second. Still see ownership consumers. So, Mike, do you see a slide that says ownership consumer? If not. OK, I'll keep going for now. Um, and hopefully the recording will be good and we can give you the recording afterwards or we can come back. So the consumer needs to, a clear communication channel because if a consumer can't communicate to report problems or understandings. And with more and more API approaches being a self-service onboarding model, they need a way of asking for help when things go wrong, especially if it's not their fault it's gone wrong or if they're just making mistakes. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, you've missed all my exciting animations I've had on the last few slides. I, I'm glad to hear you're back. I, and so there has to be a feedback loop for your external consumers coming in. And I am preaching this at every client I go to and every client goes, we don't want to pay someone to maintain this feedback communication loop. And I am frustrated by it. A few people have done it now. But you need either an email address, a phone number, or, or ideally an online forum. So again, AP, IBM API Connect has the facility for an online forum inside of it. And this means that you can then go and sort of ask for help or show what you're doing or talk to people to, or, or say this does not work. If you because if you are advertising an API platform to the public, you may not have a ticketed system. You may not have a contract with SLAs in place. And, and so for me, I'd always like to assume that this is not just enabled, but clearly understood by the consumers at the same time. So they know how they can go and get help. For example, if you use an IBM product, you will know you raise a case or a PMR or whatever you call it this week. Um, but if I'm going to start using, let's say, um, Bob's groceries APIs, I don't know how to go and request help if it goes wrong. And this is something that's very often overlooked of, oh, they'll just phone us up. How? Who will they phone? How will they know how to do this? And this is something that needs to be very clearly defined as we go through. So this is sort of the summary of what I wanted to talk about. I appreciate it. It's five or six different biddy pieces because governance is such a subjective topic. But it helps if I click on the right screen. Um, but the key takeaways I hope you get from it is governance is essential to maintain any any API state. I have a word large here, but I'll say any API state that has more than six APIs. There's no one size fits all. Everything here is subjective. Every company is different. Everyone that is finding needs, but you should be able to accept that this is a living approach. Your governance strategy will need to adapt as needs change, especially with the velocity of some, that some people are trying to work to. If that velocity in order to get that velocity high, you need to keep looking on our rules and validate is the additional pain points you're adding justified? And the, some of the answers may well be yes. 
we want to make sure that we're consistent. We want to make sure our consumers have the best and easiest experience possible. Or otherwise, you might be just get all the shit out. So get all the uh, ones out there as quick as possible. So we look good to our bosses. I've seen both strategies out there. Uh, don't be scared to adapt and optimize a process occasionally. Do not do it weekly. Six monthly, you can go back and look at the process, what's worked, what's not worked, and change it. Governance is enforced essentially by a police force, but the rulers of the process should be prepared to change the rules if they are not working or not meeting the need. And finally, remember consistency in communication. From everything I've seen around the world, these are the two things that are the hardest for people to get right. Because you need to start thinking in the eyes of the people on the other side of the table. The API, you have to think of the API consumers, what's going to make their life easier. You have to think on how are the relevant people going to be contacted? How does the infrastructure team know who they're going to need to talk to if they are supporting this? Once your team disappears, who is going to be responsible for the APIs? Or if your team disappears? So that's all I've got today. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening to me. Does anyone have any questions? We've got six minutes left. Uh, sorry for going quite quickly through this, but I had a lot to cover. Uh, type them in chat, smoke signals, interpretive dance, whatever works best. So if there's no questions, I'm going to take five minutes back and get a coffee. That's my threat to you guys. Or I'll start asking more difficult questions to you lot. Does anyone fundamentally disagree with anything I've said or fundamentally agree with it? Is anyone actually listening? I think it's just you and me, Kathy. I was listening intently. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> I feel reassured now. Well, in that case, if there's no questions, uh, uh, yes, that's a fair point. So, uh, so Mike, if you come to the IBM booth and uh, get a message to Kathy, I will happily send you the slides. Please could it, please could regulate the mandate in open banking API governments. So, are you saying is uh, could regulators mandate the governance for open banking? To a degree, they do. But mainly, uh, but then you're talking about a different type of governance. Um, there's, there's governance, I say, has many different concepts. Part of the governance is ownership, part of, of, of which level of information. I'm talking about here of the API itself, as, as such as the content of the information going through it. Regulators often just say, this is the specification we want you to follow. So in terms of the API governance we're talking here, they, they may add a few tweaks, such as you must uh, provide this information, you must do a version strategy for your APIs with these matching versions. So they may influence it, yes. They may mandate some influ influence. I'm not sure what it's done today. I haven't looked at the recent specifications. But there are many aspects that will be outside their domain and more into the domain. We're currently working on open banking relations and want to ensure uniform approach to APIs. So great. So that was the approach that the UK did as opposed to the UK open banking did as opposed to the EU approach. So the UK open banking had very hard specifications of this is what you are going to do. Um, and this is this is what people must implement, whereas the rest of Europe had a more loosely one. Uh, oh, you'll see the open banking framework. I was reading about that yesterday and I can't remember why now. Uh, I, I like to try and keep on top of this stuff. Um, and, and so the key thing is you want the, reg the regulators, from, in my opinion, to be as hard regulations as possible because you want, in, Mr. Nigerian investor, you want your consumer's life to be as easy as possible because you're going to have a million consumers or 100,000 API developers using your APIs and probably 10 to 15 people building APIs. So you, what you need to do is you need to mandate that people provide these APIs and you must mandate the specification down to the operation and data models they're responding with so that your consumer's life is as easy as possible. So uh, one of my oldest friends is a fintech developer and he is uh, for one of the London fintechs and he is con enjoying working with the UK banks because they all have the same specification as determined by our open banking consortium. 
However, the European banks each have their own slightly different way of doing it, which is making everything a lot harder. And in order for an open banking framework to be successful, it is all on the consumption and the consumers. It is not on what is being provided. And that is the challenge I think you're going to have. Um, and the only way you get all that together is by working closely with the banks to say, we are coming up with one standard for you all and let the banks weigh in on that standard and, and have their piece of flesh in it, have their skin in the game. Does that make sense, Mr. Nigerian investor? I'm going to take silence as that I bored you and you fell asleep or you agree, but hopefully that's good. Well, in that case, we've got two minutes till the next session begins. So thank you everyone for, for listening to me. Uh, I hope you all have a great day and you've enjoyed API days and uh, any questions, please reach out to Kathy. She's put an email just nice in the chat and then uh, we can uh, link up and, and I'm happy to have any quick discussions on any of these topics. If you disagree, please contact me even more importantly, because I want to have that debate. There is no magical answer here. And everyone, please visit the IBM booth in the partner village. There you go, Kathy. I've had my coffee. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.